Welcome to Learning with the Cleveland Orchestra. My name is Rose Breckenridge, and I'm lecturing today for the Cleveland Orchestra series, Music in Depth. We're looking at uh, Joseph Suk and his string serenade in E flat major. I'll be talking about Suk's life and his musical style, and I'll also give you background for the string serenade, plus a musical tour of the piece. Joseph Suk uh, lived from 1874 to 1935. He was born in a Bohemian village. His father, also named Joseph, trained his son in music from an early age, and the boy grew up to become an accomplished composer and violinist. From 1885 to 1892, Suk studied at the Prague Conservatory, where he became a student of Antonin Dvorak. Suk was inspired by his teacher and soon became Dvorak's favorite pupil. Suk also grew close to the teacher's family, especially Dvorak's daughter, Otilia. And Suk fell in love with Otilia and finally married her in 1898. He was 24 at the time and she was 20. They had a son, also named Joseph, who grew up to have a son also named Yosef, and this last Yosef Suk, who was the grandson of Otili and her husband Yosef, became the famous 20th century violinist, Yosef Suk, who lived from 1929 to 2011. So you can see there were a lot of Yosef Suks, but we're talking about uh, the one who lived from 1874 to 1935. In 1904, Dvorak died suddenly of a stroke, and Suk, remember, his devoted pupil and now son-in-law, was just filled with grief. He decided to compose a symphony in Dvorak's honor. While working on the piece, Suk's young wife died unexpectedly in 1905, just 14 months after her father died. She died of heart failure. Suk was totally devastated. The two most important people in his life were gone. After a time of great mourning when he was uh, frozen in his grief, he finally returned to composing his symphony. And he decided to add two more movements in honor of his wife uh, to the three that he had already completed. Each one of the symphony's five movements captures a different aspect of grief but peaceful acceptance is not reached until the very end of the work. Suk's deep sorrow is embodied not only in the music, but in the subtitle that he gave to the symphony, Asaral. Asaral in Islamic and Jewish folklore and folk legends is the name of the angel of death. And this angel of death is sent to gently separate the soul from the body of the dying person in order to bring that person's soul up to God. Suk also had a career as a performing uh, violinist. While he was still a student, he formed the Bohemian Quartet. He played second violin. The group gained an international reputation and toured extensively. They became known as the Czech Quartet in 1918. And Suk played in this quartet for most of his life from 1893 to 1933. That's 40 years. Suk also taught at the Prague Conservatory from 1922 to 1935. His pupils included the famous Czech composer Martinu. He was held in high esteem there and he was twice named to be head of the conservatory. He died in 1935 at age 61, and he's buried in the cemetery of St. Luke's Church in the very Czech village where he was born. Now his music, uh, his, the, it's noted especially in his early compositions, uh, he had a great lyric gift. Uh, we'll see that in the serenade. And this reveals uh, the influence of his mentor, Antonin Dvorak, and also uh, the lyric romanticism of the late 19th century. But unlike Dvorak, 
who was much more optimistic, Sook had a bent towards melancholy. And so that great crisis we talked about uh, that occurred in 1904 and 1905, when he lost uh, first his father-in-law and then his wife, deeply impacted him. And after he finally recovered, he emerged a changed man, both in his personal life, he never remarried, and in his professional life, his compositional musical style began to evolve. Music was his lifeline. Uh, he composed and performed, and doing that helped him deal with those tragic blows of fate. So after this crisis, uh, he began to experiment in his compositions with chromatic dissonance and polytonality, and uh, writing music that did not have strong key centers. The tensions of his time, uh, namely World War I and then his country's uh, fight for independence, found their way into his music and his style became more modernistic. Thus his music uh, became a bridge, if you will, from uh, late 19th century romanticism to 20th century atonality. Now, although Sook made little use of Czech folk music in his compositions, like his mentor Dvorak had, he was highly regarded by his people. In fact, his Astral Symphony, uh, composed in memory of his father-in-law and his wife, would become a substitute national anthem for the Czech people during their times of Nazi and Soviet oppression. Well, let's talk more about the String Serenade in E flat major. He composed this serenade in 1892 when he was only 18 years old. It was his final composition for his teacher, Antonin Dvorak, at the Prague Conservatory. Dvorak had noticed Sook's melancholy tendency to write in minor, gloomy keys. So, as summer approached, he told Sook, it's summertime now, go and write something lively for a change. The implication, of course, being use major keys. So Sook complied, and that summer he produced this string serenade in E flat major. It would become one of his most popular compositions. He did conduct two movements of it in late 1893, that was at Tabor, which is a town south of Prague. Uh, the premiere of the complete serenade uh, did not occur until February of 1895, and that was at the Prague Conservatory. And this performance, uh, his violin teacher, Antonin Benevitz, conducted, showing his great approval for his uh, former student's uh, composition. So uh, the publisher Simrock actually, on the recommendation of Johannes Brahms, published uh, Sook's uh, String Serenade in 1896. Brahms had come to know the piece through his friendship with Dvorak. And that publication of Sook's String uh, Serenade helped to launch the young uh, man's career. Interestingly enough, uh, Brahms had similarly advanced Dvorak's career in the late 1870s when uh, he had recommended uh, the unknown Dvorak's uh, composition Moravian Dances to his own publisher, Simrock, uh, for them to publish, and that helped launch Dvorak's career. Now, the string serenade uh, in E flat uh, is actually uh, in four movements, and they're all in major keys at his, as we mentioned, his teacher Dvorak's specific request. Uh, but the happy moods are more gentle rather than jolly, and some pensive movements uh, and moments will show up at times. Plus, the movements don't follow uh, the usual pattern. Uh, the usual pattern would be a fast opening movement, a slow second movement, a, din a minuet dance uh, uh, 
and then uh, a finale. Instead, what Sook does is he makes his opening movement uh, slow on Dante, and then an allegro shows up as a second movement, uh, and then the third movement is a very slow adagio, uh, and then the fourth movement finally is a quite cheerful uh, allegro. So let's start our musical tour. The opening movement on Dante Con Moto in the home key of E flat major is lovely and lyrical. Uh, the opening theme is quite tranquil and peaceful and it uh, outlines a falling chord and the violins perform it first uh, before the cellos take it over. It's a rather gentle uh, presentation, not overly loud, uh, but uh, what Sook does is he has the um, music gradually crescendo and climb to a higher and higher pitch uh, before he brings that theme back in a very uh, dramatic and uh, uh, lovely, strong presentation. quite contrasting to that falling chord outline uh, is a rising melody that goes by steps and it has a kind of a nostalgic feel to it. idea, the um, uh, falling chord outline, uh, when Sook brings it back uh, initially, he doesn't give it to the full orchestra or even to the violins, but rather to a solo violin. So let's hear that exquisite return. gentle and quiet uh, with the uh, exquisite solo um, and gradually it's going to lead to a quite fortissimo reprise of this idea before uh, the music of this movement dies away. So let's hear uh, that final. <laughs>
music gently dies away to end the movement. Uh, well, we finally get to an allegro uh, with the uh, second movement, uh, but it, it's a ma non troppo, uh, which means not too fast, and uh, a grazioso, very graceful. Uh, moving to B flat major, uh, the opening melody is a kind of a lilting waltz uh, on its tiptoes, if you will, uh, with shifting accents uh, at times, going back and forth between the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, uh, sort of uh, idea. Oh, it's just quite lovely. So here is our second movement. second idea that uh, is a foil or contrast uh, appears first in the full strings uh, and it has a, a wonderful playful skipping comment uh, in the strings so uh, let's uh, hear that idea What he does with the second idea is quite wonderful. Uh, he's going to move it up and add these very high, delicate trills as he builds uh, it to a kind of dramatic climax. So let's hear that moment. dramatic climax, uh, the dynamic levels drops, uh, and when that occurs, uh, we're going to hear some lovely uh, solos enter in. that would lead us back uh, to a return of the opening uh, tiptoe waltz, if you will. Uh, but he gives us a, a surprise because right when we would be expecting that to occur, there's a sudden harsh outburst that literally erupts.
so that harsh uh, outburst fades away and our gentle tiptoe waltz takes over to end the movement. The third movement, Adagio, very slow in G major, it's the longest movement and it's the emotional heart uh, of the whole work. Of the opening melody, a uh, beautiful melody, is given to the solo cello. Here it is. tender, uh, but as we move it over to the violins, uh, the intensity grows. very slow moving melody uh, and uh, Sook really dwells on it for quite a long time, over four minutes developing it, moving it around uh, to different keys and uh, adding different uh, areas of color uh, by showcasing uh, different instruments in the uh, string orchestra. When we come finally to our second area, this uh, uh, next theme has a little more movement to it. Uh, it is literally exquisitely beautiful, and it comes uh, in entering at a higher range. Let's hear that. This is the lead up to it. picked up the pace with the pizzicatos underneath. Next, what he does is he gives that melody over to uh, several violin solos before the tutti group grabs it back. Pizzicatos underneath uh, increase the um, movement agitation of the area. Now that very slow moving and tranquil opening theme uh, is going to return in the very, very high strings uh, as it uh, gradually moves back uh, to the main key of the movement. We're going to move on to our fourth movement, finally, not only in a major key, 
but jolly, allegro giocoso. But a little disclaimer, not too lively. I'm not troppo presto. Back to E major, pardon me, E flat major, uh, for a very uh, energetic finale. It opens up with this racing staccato idea that just runs off, and we think that's the main idea, but very quickly, this slower moving upward uh, idea comes in underneath the bustling racing theme, and we realize, oh, that was a counter melody. And so the two uh, different melodies traveling at different speeds uh, create this uh, contrapuntal texture to open our uh, energetic, jolly finale. <laughs> That uh, bustling counter melody and uh, the upward striding idea underneath uh, take up our interest for several minutes uh, before uh, uh, Sook introduces our next uh, important theme, and it's quite a contrast. It enters uh, with very solemn, uh, slow moving chords. Uh, it's almost uh, like a procession. Um, so let's hear the lead up and transition to that quite contrasting idea. <laughs> marks the score largamente, uh, so very solemn and broad. What a contrast between that bustling, racing counter melody uh, and that striding upward idea that appears with it. Now, in the midsection development, uh, Sook very interestingly develops this high-low dialogue, if you will, uh, taking uh, the ideas from the opening, uh, more agitated uh, notions um, and the striding upward, and creates this back and forth, low strings, high strings, low string, high strings, uh, in an unstable uh, area tonally. Let's hear that. <laughs> of interest there in terms of how he's working with his musical materials. Now at the end we expect a reprise of these ideas, uh, most notably especially the opening bustling idea uh, combined with that upward striding uh, uh, moment. And he starts to give that to us, uh, but then he surprises us by slowing everything down and bringing back that tranquil idea from the opening movement, uh, the falling chord outline. So let's hear as he uh, makes that amazing transition. <laughs> Oh, 
totally altering the jolly mood, if you will, of the finale. But he doesn't end like this. Uh, he um, pushes it back up and gives us a wonderful Vivace coda uh, where everything becomes quite exciting, exciting and lively again. Uh, so let's hear that. <laughs> It's a great piece, and it's amazing that an 18-year-old composed it. Uh, we're so uh, delighted. I hope you get a chance to listen to the whole thing. My name is Rose Breckenridge.